The Evolution of Mucogenital Surgery to Periodontal Plastic Surgery Mucogenital surgery was designed to get a functional result, while periodontal plastic surgery produces not only a functional result, but also an aesthetic result. So let's talk about the evolution in history. First of all, 35 years ago, the emphasis was on function and not on aesthetics. Surgical techniques were referred to as mucogenital surgery, which, as I've just said, evolved into periodontal plastic surgery. Mucogenital surgery was defined by Friedman in the Texas Dental Journal in 1957. This involved surgery to deepen the vestibule and uh, to address an aberrant frenum. And prior to 1941, much more frenal surgery was done. More about that in just a second. And finally, to create keratinized tissue. Prior to any soft tissue grafting and gaining keratinized tissue, this was a brutalizing procedure that is now basically obsolete. By removing vast areas of tissue and leaving bone exposed, cells from the periodontal ligament space will migrate over this denuded bone and end up with great pocket elimination but significant bone loss and obviously this was a slow, painful healing procedure, as I said, is obsolete. Now, let's go back to address the aberrant frenum. What Broadbent found was that as the maxillary permanent central incisors erupted, 96% of children had a midline diastema. And because of this, prior to the publication of this article, it was routine in the delivery room to go in and, quote, clip the frenum to prevent the formation of the midline diastema. But with the publication of Broadbent's work, he found, as I said earlier, that 96% of children had a midline diastema as the maxillary central incisors er erupted. But as the maturation process moves and the teeth, other teeth erupt and move forward, by the time the premolars are fully in place, only 4% of children still have a midline diastema. So the protocol now uh, dictates that we wait until the premolars come in before planning any frenal surgery. Periodontal plastic surgery. Surgery to correct anatomical, developmental, or traumatic deformities of the gingiva and alveolar mucosa, a definition that I presented in the dental clinics of North America in 1988. Mucogenital surgery, surgery to deepen the vestibule, treatment of the aberrant frenum. So let's talk about treatment of the aberrant frenum and what is an aberrant frenum. And in this particular case, we're going to talk about deepening the vestibule in a young child to prevent the future pull of the frenum. And in a classic article published by Bohannon in the Journal of Periodontology in 1963, which is popularly known as the lead shot technique, what Bohannon did, he made a split thickness incision, but before he did that, he placed a lead shot in the vestibule and took a lateral head film. Then he did a split thickness flap and very importantly, did not expose bone. And then after the surgical procedure, he placed the lead shot and took another lateral head film. Ultimately, when complete healing took place, the vestibule completely reformed and he placed a, a lead shot there, and it was exactly the same level as it was preoperatively. So next we come along to the technique by Herman Korn. And what Herman did was to go ahead and make a split thickness incision at the mucogingival junction, and it was split thickness for about five millimeters, and then significant bone was exposed in that area. And when bone is exposed, that will scar over and you'll get permanent deepening of the vestibule. This was an article that Dr. Korn published in the Journal of Periodontology in 1962. So here we see on the left, uh, the frenum there, the shallow vestibule, and you'll notice that the central incisor and labial version has thin tissue on the facial. What we're planning on doing here, or what we did here, was to go ahead and do the periosteal separation fenestration, form the apical scar, and therefore, when that tooth is realigned orthodontically, not only will the gingival margins even up, but the tissue on the facial of that central will thicken up, 
and it's not necessary to do a classic phrenectomy. So this is the apical scar that we talked about. Here's another case, and you will notice on this central incisor where there's a pencil mark that there is some recession there. So the procedure was performed, and two weeks later, look how that tissue is already beginning to rebound and creep up. So therefore, no any type of grafting to treat that recession will not be necessary in the future. Another modification of this technique is in the maxillary arch, and this patient had a very shallow vestibule having worn a denture for about 50 years, and there's not enough bone to do implants, so what we did, again, used the technique that Herman Korn talked about and went in there and did a vestibular extension in the maxillary arch, and here we can see where originally we had about a seven millimeter vestibule and now we have a 12 millimeter vestibule, which adds markedly to the retention of this denture. And in a video, the patient reported that the denture was not only stable, but she was also able to chew cashew nuts on that. So the, the corn technique has many applications, not only in the young child, but also in the mature adult who's been wearing a denture for many years. So on the left, we see the pre-op, the shallow vestibule, and on the right, we can see, as we pointed out area, a vestibule that is now 12 millimeters deep rather than seven. For more in-depth information on performing these surgical techniques, please view the following videos. Vestibular deepening and the single tooth implant, surgical management of the mandibular frenum, and finally, surgical management of the maxillary frenum. And in closing, I'd like to thank Jonathan Cheney, who has helped me with all of these videos, who's my web designer and video editor. Thank you so much, Jonathan.